Beginning in 1661, the Chateau of Versailles would be transformed by Louis XIV into an immense and extravagant palace, which eventually became the seat of his court and government, making it the de facto capital of France. The building had begun as a small hunting lodge built by his father, but as Versailles grew, Louis XIV felt the need to construct a retreat where he could get away from the arduous pomp of life in the court and pursue his affair with his mistress, Madame de Montespan. The result was a remarkable pleasure pavilion inspired by accounts of the Far East. Composed of a central building flanked by four smaller structures, it was decorated with white and blue ceramic tiles made in imitation of Chinese porcelain. Continuing this theme, all of the interior, from tiles to woodwork, stucco, and even furniture, had been painted white and blue. Behind the main building was a formal garden using an innovative system of flowers buried in pots, which could be replaced very quickly. This allowed fresh flowers grown in hothouses to be put out at any time, including the middle of winter, and enabled the decorative scheme of perfumed and exotic flowers to be changed during the course of a single day. Built in 1670, the structure was located on what had once been the village of Trianon and became known as the Trianon de Porcelaine. But before long, cracks began to appear in the king's relationship with Montespan, as well as in the fragile decorative tiles of the pleasure pavilion he had dedicated to her. So in 1687, he ordered that the structure be demolished and replaced by a more durable building of marble. This is what's known as the Grand Trianon. Despite having stood for a mere 17 years, however, the Trianon de Porcelaine would have a long-lasting impact, as it marked the first major example of chinoiserie. Europeans had long been fascinated by stories of an immensely rich and exotic empire located far to the east, and as Chinese luxury goods like porcelain, silk, and lacquerware began to flow to the west beginning in the 16th century, local designers started imitating and adapting the decorative forms found on them for a wide variety of objects. These imitations later became known as chinoiserie, French for Chinese-like, and following the example of Louis XIV's porcelain pavilion, the style was increasingly used for interior schemes, and even entire buildings. Before long, no court residence was complete without at least a Chinese room, and Chinese summer houses, pavilions, and follies began to spring up in the surrounding parks and gardens. But as Western knowledge of China was still extremely limited, these buildings tended to rely on a fair amount of imagination, and to represent a European dream of a distant and wondrous place, rather than an accurate reproduction of Chinese architecture. Reaching the height of its popularity in the mid-18th century, chinoiserie became closely associated with Rococo, and was characterized by exuberant decoration, asymmetry, and a focus on lightheartedness and fun. As a result, the style was often considered to be frivolous, and only suitable for less serious spaces like gardens. Even so, chinoiserie has left behind many spectacular buildings, and makes up a fascinating chapter in the history of European architecture. Here, I put together some noteworthy examples. Seventy-five years after the construction of Louis XIV's porcelain pavilion, Frederick the Great of Prussia was building his own royal retreat on the outskirts of Potsdam near Berlin. Meant as a place of relaxation rather than a seat of power, this Rococo-style summer palace was named Sans Souci, meaning without worries or carefree in French. Following the completion of the main building in 1747, Frederick turned his attention to the creation of a surrounding park, which he adorned with numerous small temples and follies, one of them being an imaginative interpretation of a Chinese house. This structure was modelled on the Maison du Trèfle, a 1738 pavilion built for the Duke of Lorraine in the garden of his palace of Luneville. Its unusual trefoil shape was inherited by the Chinese house at Sans Souci. Designed by the garden architect Johann Gottfried Buring, it was given a curved tent-like copper roof, supported at the entrances by four gilded sandstone pillars, made in the shape of palm trees. Gilded statues of Chinese figures, eating, drinking, or playing music, were placed all along the walls, and are also found sitting at the feet of the columns. 
One of them, with an open parasol, can even be found on top of the cupola crowning the roof. The central chamber below leads into three small cabinets, and features a painted ceiling with leisurely scenes of oriental men and women surrounded by parrots, monkeys, and buddhas. Construction of the building began in 1755, but it stalled during the Seven Years' War, and was only completed nine years later. Another chinoiserie pavilion, known as the Dragon House, was built by Frederick in the 1770s, and was made to resemble a Chinese pagoda. It stands in the royal vineyard at Klausberg, just north of Sanssouci Park, and was intended as living quarters for the local vintner. The Prussian king had been stimulated to make the second Chinese-inspired building by the publications of a British architect called Sir William Chambers. In his youth, Chambers had actually travelled to China on three occasions, and after establishing his architectural practice in London in the 1750s, he released a book about the buildings, furniture, and clothing he had seen in the Far East. He was soon appointed architectural tutor to the Prince of Wales, later George III, and started working for the prince's mother, Augusta. She had him design several fanciful garden buildings at Kew, including temples, a ruined arch, and a now-lost chinoiserie-style pavilion known as the House of Confucius. The two-story octagonal structure overlooked a lake, and on the walls and ceilings were paintings related to the historical events of the philosopher's lifetime. The crowning work of his time at Kew Gardens, however, was the Great Pagoda, built in 1761. Located at the southern end of the gardens, it was framed by two other structures which also drew on exotic, non-Western traditions, the Alhambra and the Mosque. Standing 50 meters tall, it consisted of 10 octagonal stories, each slightly diminishing in diameter and height, and was decorated with a total of 80 sculptures of dragons. The top was gilded, and the chambers described how the building was originally covered in, quote, a kind of thin glass of various colors, which produces a most dazzling reflection. In 1763, Chambers published an account of the structures at Kew, which included a lavish description and three accompanying illustrations of the pagoda, suggesting that he was extremely proud of this building, even though he is mostly known for designing classical architecture. On the morning of the 24th of July, 1753, a 120-shot cannon salute could be heard thundering from the royal palace of Drottningholm near Stockholm. This marked the beginning of the birthday celebrations for the 34-year-old Queen Luisa Ulrika of Sweden. The festivities lasted the entire day, and in the afternoon, the king invited her for a promenade in the park, where she found a surprise gift. In a letter to her mother, Luisa wrote, quote, he brought me to one side of the garden, and I was surprised to suddenly be part of a fairy tale, for the king had built a Chinese castle, the most beautiful one can see. She continues to describe how the entire court had dressed up in Chinese clothes, as well as her eldest son, the seven-year-old Crown Prince Gustav, who read her a poem and presented her with a golden key to the building. Having been prefabricated in Stockholm, this log structure known as the Chinese Pavilion had been transported to the palace in secret, and quickly put up before the queen could notice a thing. However, it wasn't built to last, and within a decade it had become dilapidated. A new, larger, and more durable pavilion was constructed in its stead, which was finished in 1769, and still stands today. Heavily influenced by French Rococo, it consists of four smaller structures and a main building connected to its wings by a series of curved rooms. Inside, the pavilion is decorated with Chinese-inspired, locally-produced furniture and Chinese luxury goods imported through the Swedish East India Company. The royal family lived in the pavilion in summer, and would have dinner in one of the smaller buildings called the Confidence. There, a dining table had been fixed on a lift device, and could be set on the floor below before being hoisted up to the dining room. This meant that the royals could eat their dinner without the presence of servants, or en confidence, as it was called. Following Crown Prince Gustav's ascension to the throne, there were also plans to erect a Chinese pagoda on a nearby hill. 
but like many other of the king's building projects, it was never realized because of his assassination in 1792. Inspired by pavilions like the one at Drottningholm, Catherine the Great of Russia also decided to follow the fashion for chinoiserie. However, she intended to outdo her contemporaries in terms of scale and accuracy. At her residence at Tsarskoye Selo, about 24 kilometers or 15 miles south of St. Petersburg, she ordered her architects Antonio Rinaldi and Charles Cameron to design an entire Chinese village. It was to consist of 18 houses, faced with glazed faience tiles, and the composition would center around an octagonal domed observatory, closely modeled after contemporary Chinese engraving from her personal collection. To complement this ensemble, the Empress also planned to build an eight-tiered tower, a near copy of the Great Pagoda at Kew Gardens. Construction began in the 1780s, but ground to halt with the death of Catherine in 1796. Only ten of the houses had been completed, and the elaborate Chinese-style roof of the observatory was not implemented. The idea of glazed tiles also had to be scrapped when it became clear that they couldn't withstand the frost, and instead the buildings were painted with Chinese motifs. Work did not resume until 1818, when Alexander I asked the architect Vasily Stasov to overhaul the village in order to provide accommodation for his guests. This resulted in the removal of much of the orientalizing decor and the construction of a spherical dome on the observatory. The village suffered serious damage in World War II, but with few funds available in the post-war period, restoration would have to wait until the 1990s. This wasn't Catherine the Great's only chinoiserie project. Just next to the village stands the Creaking Pagoda, named after the characteristic sound produced by its metal weather vane, and in the same park you can find several ornate Chinese-inspired bridges and the ruins of what was once the Chinese theatre. From the very beginning, Europe's Chinese pavilions and palaces had been built as retreats, where their owners could escape their everyday worries. And perhaps more than any other, this was the case with our last building, created to the backdrop of war and revolution. In December 1798, King Ferdinand of Naples and Sicily left his capital on the mainland as the armies of the French Republic advanced from the north. Within a month, the city had been captured and Ferdinand's old kingdom had been replaced by the Parthenopean Republic. Under the protection of the British Navy, he escaped to Sicily, where he would mostly remain until the defeat of Napoleon allowed him to permanently recapture the mainland in 1815. Once on the island, Ferdinand purchased a small Chinese-style villa north of Palermo and asked the architect Giuseppe Venanzio Marvulia to expand it into a residence fit for a king. The result is the Palazzina Cinese, a highly original and eccentric building that mixes neoclassical symmetry with Gothic arches and Chinese-inspired decor. Placed within an ornate Italian garden, it has two tall porticos surmounted by pagoda-like roofs, and running along its facade are continuous balconies accessible from detached towers with spiral staircases. In the basement, there is a large ballroom decorated in Louis XVI style, and the Hall of Ruins next to it features a trompe painting, giving the appearance of a collapsed ceiling. Ascending to the first floor on an external staircase, you'll find a reception hall decorated with paintings depicting scenes of oriental life, the personal rooms of King Ferdinand, and a dining room equipped with the mathematical table, a similar contrivance to the one at Drottningholm, allowing plates to be discreetly hoisted up from the kitchen below. The second floor was reserved for Queen Maria Carolina, who, with the exception of a Turkish-style living room, mostly chose to decorate her apartment in a less eccentric, neoclassical manner. A series of portraits of the royal family found in one of the rooms were personally painted by her, and captioned with texts like My Support under the King, and Images of My Tenderness under her children. Completed in 1806, the Palazzina Cinese would remain in the ownership of the family until 1860, when, as a result of the unification of Italy, the residence passed to the House of Savoy. 
Having since become the property of the local municipality, it is now a museum. As the 18th century drew to a close, the Orientalist craze was gradually replaced with a strict neoclassicism. With the outbreak of the French Revolution, the decadence and frivolousness of chinoiserie was shunned, and morality took over as the new custom, mimicking the purity of the Roman Republic and Athenian democracy as a way to counter aristocratic excess. The style continued to wane during much of the 19th century, when the appeal of China and East Asia had to compete with other exotic tastes, such as the Turkish, Egyptian, Gothic, and Greek. However, chinoiserie never completely went away, and remains popular in interior design even today. 